If you're a guest with us, we want to say a special welcome. We are grateful that you have joined us for worship. You should have received a copy of the worship guide as well as a copy of the sermon notes when you came in. So the sermon notes will be helpful for you later in our time in God's words. We look at John chapter 17. We're in a series in the Gospel of John now. Uh, sorry. And then uh, in the worship guide itself, you'll find on the back some announcements about our church, things that are happening in the life of our congregation. On the front side, you'll see the order of service there, so that'll be helpful for you during our time in worship. And then in the middle, you will find a blue tear-out. So if you would like to communicate anything at all with Christ Fellowship Church this morning, if you have any prayer requests that you want to communicate with our elders, uh, questions about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be part of this church, be baptized, whatever that is, uh, we would love to answer those. You can fill that form out, drop it in the offering basket later in our time in worship, or you can use that QR code that is on the front. And so either one will take you essentially to the same place. We'd love to uh, be useful and helpful for you uh, for any questions that you have. Every week as we come to a time of worship, we like to take just a few moments beforehand to still our hearts before the Lord. So let me invite you to do that. Take just a few moments and then we'll begin our time in worship together. call to worship is on the front of your worship guide. It is Psalm 28, 6 through 9. I'm going to read this and then we will pray and thank the Lord for who he is as we worship him this morning. Blessed be the Lord for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exults and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. O oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Let's pray together. So Lord, you are a God who hears. We praise you as a God who forgives. You're a God who shows mercy. You're a God who exhibits kindness and compassion toward your people. You're a God who is long-suffering, a God who is patient. You are a God who protects your people. You're a God who defends your people, who shields your people against the hateful darts of the enemy. You're a God who never breaks the promise. You're faithful in all that you say and do. You're a God who helps those who look to you. You're a God who brings joy a giver, a supplier, a savior, a redeemer, a refuge, a deliverer, a shepherd, a friend, a king forever and ever. And so, God, we do gather this morning before you to praise you for who you are and for what you have done. Would you make your people content and happy and joyful in you again this morning by your Holy Spirit? Would you lift up Christ in our sights? Would you bless us that we might even more bless your name? We ask in Christ's name. Amen. The Psalm 133 verse 1 is our greeting, mutual greeting. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. In the same way that the Lord welcomes us into his presence, we want to welcome one another to Christ Fellowship Church this morning. I invite you to stand and do that.
Would you sing with us this morning? A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the blood of mortal ills
what he's done for us. So we will be called to confess our sins this morning from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. You find it in the, the bottom of the first page of your worship guide. But before I read this text, this is a, a thing we do on a regular basis here at CFC, on, on a weekly basis in our worship service, where we come before the Lord after acknowledging who he is, singing his praise, uh, seeing his character and who he is, we acknowledge that we are not what we are supposed to be. We've done things that we should not have done. And so those things we would call sin. And as a part of being in God's presence, sin ought not to dwell there. It cannot dwell there. And so we come to turn from that sin, to, to confess it, to name it, and to, to repent of it, to turn around and ask God for his grace. And so that's what we'll do with this, with this prayer of confession. I'll read this text. Then I'm going to lead us in a prayer out loud. Just invite you to pray alongside me in your heart using these same words to confess your own sins to God. But the apostle Paul writes this in Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Let's pray together. Our great triune God in heaven, we do marvel at your glorious nature, Father, Son, and Spirit, existing in perfect fellowship, perfect harmony, perfect unity, unity of mind, unity of purpose, and unity of love. And in your great mercy, by the new and living way that's been opened up for us by Jesus Christ, you've drawn us into this blessed communion, this fellowship divine. 
And you've united us to yourself, the triune God. And now as followers of Jesus, you call us to live together in unity with one another on the earth as a reflection of the unity that exists in heaven. But we must confess that we have not walked in this as we ought. You called us to walk in humility, but we confess how deeply pride resides in our hearts. We take offense when we are not given recognition that other people receive. We do our best to highlight our own achievements and accomplishments. Sometimes we do that subtly, and sometimes we do that flagrantly. All the while, we scoff at other people and their successes, downplaying them in order to save face ourselves. In all these ways and more, we've acted in pride, and we, can, we confess that through our lack of humility, we have not walked in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have called us. You called us to walk in gentleness, but we confess our personal distaste for this fruit of your Holy Spirit. Instead of gentleness, we've responded to other people with harshness, rudeness, and cruelty. We confess being unnecessarily harsh in our correction of our children. We confess how we have responded with rudeness when someone requests our help or inconveniences us in the slightest way. We confess our tendency to use words of cruelty that tear down rather than gently building other people up. We confess that through this lack of gentleness, we haven't walked in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called. And if we thought our lack of gentleness was a problem, Lord, we are even more ashamed by our lack of patience. We confess our tendency to see other people as our problem when really patience is our problem. We've been impatient with all kinds of people, impatient with our coworkers, and our customers, impatient with our own parents and our own kids, impatient with our students and our spouses, impatient with other drivers on the road and other neighbors down the street. Worst of all, we've been impatient at times even with one another in this room, the people that we have been united with in Christ. And so we confess through our lack of patience that we haven't walked in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have called us. Lord, you command us to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, but we acknowledge that we've been eager to do many other things instead. We confess our eagerness to be in the know, and so we engage in gossip, saying behind other people's backs what we are too cowardly to say in front of them. We confess our eagerness to get a laugh, and so we make fun of others and rationalize it as just joking around. We confess our eagerness to get our way, and so we challenge others, even steamroll other people's needs so that things work out best for us. And underneath all of those things, Lord, is a failure to love. And so we confess that through our lack of bearing with one another in love, we have not walked in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have called us. And so for all these sins and for many more, we acknowledge our unworthiness. We're unfit to stand before you on our own, and so we come under the merciful arms of Jesus. And we do ask for your forgiveness. We are unworthy sinners, but Christ is our worthy Savior. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in our sin, we constantly fall short. But in Jesus' mercy, he constantly bears us up. So we can see that in our preaching passage later as we get to John 17, but our assurance of pardon gives us that same picture from Psalm 68, verse 19, which says this, blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. And so even as we come acknowledging the ways that we've fallen short, the gospel reminder is that Jesus Christ stands in heaven and bears you up before the Father. His perfect righteousness in your place, his death on the cross in your place, his resurrection life for you. Jesus Christ, your salvation daily, even right now, bears you up before the Father. That's the good news of the gospel. And so having confessed our sins, each week we also remind ourselves of what we believe. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's going to be on the screen. It's also in your worship guide on the second page. I invite you to stand as we make this confession of faith as an act of worship before the Lord. So together, let us confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me, my name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his song. I know that while in heavenly states, no tongue can be this me. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. And this is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand in the wonders wrong.
preaching passage today is John 17 verses 1 through 26. Also at this time we invite all of our children in kindergarten through fifth grade who are attending Sunday school to make their way to their classrooms. John 17 verses 1 through 26. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, 
but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know you that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Fesu. Would you join me as we pray? Jesus, my prayer for now is your prayer for all time. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I am praying for you. How often we say that <coughs> phrase, sentence, as Christians. Someone tells us, I got a heavy week ahead. We respond truly, lovingly, I'm praying for you. Or, I have a procedure scheduled for Tuesday. I'm praying for you. Someone texts us. I'm tired of being lonely. We text back, I'm praying for you. We can multiply the examples. I have a job interview tomorrow. I had a miscarriage last week. I'm witnessing to my coworker tonight. Prayer is often belittled as if we are just praying for someone. But in a sense, prayer is the most Christian thing we can do for another since it invokes the triune God to do what we never can do, what we do not have the power to do. Prayer is Christian in another way. Prayer for others is something that Jesus did. In John 17, the passage of Vesu just read for us, we have what constitutes the longest prayer of Jesus in the gospel, sometimes called the high priestly prayer. In fact, that's how the ESV heads it in our translation that we use here at Christ Fellowship Church. The high priestly prayer. It's a window into the heart of Jesus as he approaches the cross. Spurgeon said of Jesus in John 17 that he poured out his soul in life before he poured it out unto death. To put it another way, unlike the Lord's Prayer, which we recite here at Christ Fellowship Church, we'll do that, Lord will, in just a bit. We recite that every week. Unlike the Lord's Prayer from Matthew chapter 6, the high priestly prayer from John 17 is, is not as much a model prayer as it is the Messiah's prayer. Not as much a model prayer as it is the Messiah's prayer. Now, no question. That we can pray the petitions, and we should. And I just did as we opened this sermon. But there is something unique. There is something important. There's something distinct about this prayer because it shows us who Jesus is for us. It shows us what Jesus does for us. It shows us how Jesus is alert to the dangers and the snares that come before us. It shows us that Jesus has great desires for our joy and our delight, what Jesus wants for us. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's my prayer that you will be encouraged by this prayer. Not only encouraged, but transformed by this prayer, comforted by the prayer, the fact that Jesus prays for you, even challenged by the fact that our lives should never be lived contrary to what Jesus is praying for us. If you're not a Christian, 
It's my prayer you'll see in Jesus someone worth trusting and following with all of your heart, that you will see a good shepherd for your own soul, which you desperately need and which Jesus will gladly be. Just to begin with this morning with the identity of prayer, and so you see the clever wording there, the prayer for us, and so we're going to think about the identity of Jesus. Who is it that is praying this prayer? And then we're going to move to the back half of it, and we're going to see what does Jesus actually pray for you and me, for those who belong to him. So let's think about the prayer, the one who is praying for us. If I could give one Bible verse outside of this passage, one Bible verse that I think encapsulates and sort of summarizes what Jesus is doing here, especially at the beginning of John chapter 17. It is found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. It's there on your notes where Paul writes that there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. I say that because every line in this prayer, every truth that comes from this prayer hinges on the fact of who Jesus is for you and me. Another way to say that, the role that Jesus occupies, the role that he fulfills for his people as our high priest, as our righteous representative before the throne. You see, one of the temptations when we come to a prayer like John 17, especially the front part of it, is we kind of skim over that. And there's a lot of language about who Jesus is, a lot of language about Jesus and his relationship to the Father. And what we want to do is we want to go immediately to those individual petitions because, after all, that's the relevant part. I mean, just tell me what it is that Jesus is praying for me. That's how I can then apply that to my life. But I want to alert you to the fact, or I want to call you to the fact, that Jesus is the relevance. It is the one who is praying for you that is supremely relevant, that makes all of those other petitions relevant by extension. Jesus is the mediator between God and men, fully God, fully man, and therefore fully able to represent us before the Father in heaven. And so that's why that first part of the prayer is so important. And so you'll notice how Jesus kind of established his, credential, his credentials both heavenward and earthward how he shows who he is in relation to the Father and how he shows who he is in relation to those who belong to him. And so first, you see it there on your notes, he is the divine son of God. That's what he is unpacking or showing, demonstrating in verses 1 through 5. Now again, we may look at the first petitions and kind of blow past that or maybe even under, misunderstand that. Jesus had spoken these words. Look at verse 1. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. So we may look at that and think divine son of God. He's actually asking though to, to be glorified. And so it seems or it can seem that Jesus here is sort of asking for some kind of battlefield promotion. You know, that, he, that he's, done a, he's done a good job. And so this sort of a reward for a job well done. And so we may think, well, Jesus is not fully God. He's asking sort of for a step up, a leveling up. But the rest of verses 2 through 5 completely contradict that and show who Jesus truly is. Notice verse 2, all the exalted things that begin, to, or that begin to be said of Jesus. Verse 2, he is the one who has authority over all flesh, who gives eternal life to all those who were entrusted to him by the Father. Jesus is the one, as we say every week, he is the judge of the living and the dead. He gives eternal life. Verse 3, same idea. To know Jesus is to have eternal life. Just as much to, to know God is to know eternal life. And this is, verse 3, eternal life, that they know you. And there's not a period full stop there, but also, right, verse 3, the, uh, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. In fact, knowledge of Jesus is the whole point of the gospel. And so if you're not a Christian, we want to be very clear that it's not just about knowing something about Jesus, but rather it is an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus. D.A. Carson said it wonderfully. He said, he said, eternal life is not so much everlasting life as, is, as knowledge of the everlasting one. It's not so much everlasting life. In other words, just, oh, it's, it's this kind of life that just never ends. Rather, it is knowledge of the everlasting one. Think about Peter. When Jesus, in John chapter 6, all the people are leaving Jesus. Uh, the, the sayings are too hard. The road is too difficult. 
And Jesus says, will you go away also? And Peter responds for the disciples and he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? For you alone have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One. This again, this is no battlefield promotion for Jesus. This is who he is from start to finish in the Gospel of John. And then verse 5, it's, it's clearer that there than any place, I think, in this opening section. Verse 5, there's no change in the status of Jesus in terms of his divinity. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence. So see, he's kind of circled back to this initial petition. So, but now he's going to amplify it. He's going to explain it a little more. He says, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Same petition, more explanation. And so we might ask the question, then what does it mean if he already had this great glory? Why, what does it mean for Jesus to be glorified? Well, the key seems to be then the hour. Notice how he connects that in verse 1. When Jesus spoke these words, the, the prayer is, Father, the hour has come Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Jesus is praying. Not that he's going to be made God at this point. He already is. But he's showing that he will be shown to be God. That he will be vindicated before the world. That's why, again, the connection with the hour. Jesus is praying that the cross and the resurrection to follow would be particularly glorifying to the Son and the Father. And we don't have to go outside the Gospel of John to see how that is. It's there on your notes. Look at John chapter 12, verse 23 and 24. Remember these words from Jesus? Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Right there we know we're in the same kind of context. We're in the same kind of idea. And what does he say? How will the Son of Man be glorified? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. In other words, the goal, Jesus' goal was not the preservation of his life, but the multiplication of his life. It wasn't the preservation of his life, but the multiplication of his life. It's the death of the son that leads to the life of the sons and daughters that leads to the praise and glory of the son and the father. That is, by the way, why we gather like clockwork here every Sunday. Because Jesus is worthy of praise. It's that intimate connection with and love for the sons and the daughters that he explains in the second part. So he is the divine son of God, but notice how he's then connected with those whom he loves. He's the shepherd of our souls, verses 6, all the way down to verse, the first part of verse 11. If you look at verses 6 through 8 in particular, maybe just kind of glance there on your Bibles, it's not hard to see the central idea. There's one word that keeps coming, or at least one form of one word, that keeps coming up over and over in verses 6 through 8. It's this word, give. You see it over and over, about half a dozen times, give or gave appears in verses 6 through 8. The main idea or the point of that repetition is to drive home the point that this, the disciples are a gift to the Father, or excuse me, gift of the Father to the Son. They belong to the Son. They are cherished by Him. Now, sometimes we speak sarcastically or critically along these lines. We, we actually use this phrase de de derisively. Sometimes we talk about people who think they are God's gift to something. You know, God's gift to football or God's gift to politics or God's gift to women. Those people, of course, think way too highly of themselves. We know better and they should as well. But the Bible is exceedingly clear that believers actually are a gift to God, to Christ. Now, so I just imagine, just kind of wrap your minds around this. Imagine yourself, believer, as a Christmas gift to Jesus. That's kind of hard to imagine, right? I mean, if someone gave me, me, I'd be thinking, I hope they didn't take the tags off, you know? <laughs> And if they did, at least maybe I could get some in-store credit, you know. But this is truly the wonder of the gospel. This is ground zero grace. Not pop psychology, but biblical theology. We even sing this way, my worth and my unworthiness. Both of them are true, neither less than the other. You are 
by yourself, believer, unworthy. Nick even prayed this way. You are unworthy to stand on your own in the presence of God, but through and because of the merits of Christ, you belong there. You're united to Christ. Your identity is completely wrapped up in His. That is what we signal to the world when we baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. We are buried with Him in baptism. We are raised to walk in newness of life. And we can never and should never consider our lives apart from Jesus. We belong to Him. And that is why Jesus prays as He does in verses 9 through 11. Do you notice what He says there? Did it strike you as somewhat strange, maybe? I am praying for them. And then he says, I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Now, I understand that verse 9, especially, can sound harsh, and it can maybe even sound unloving. How could Jesus pray this way? Could Jesus, perhaps, we may run in our minds, maybe not even say it out loud, but how could he be so callous, so hard-hearted, as to intentionally overlook those who do not belong to him? Well, again, I don't think we have to go outside the Gospel of John to actually answer that question, to address that concern. Think about the verse that is the most well-known verse, or one of the most well-known verses in all of the Bible. John 3, 16 tells us that God so loved the world, and by that it doesn't mean that there was some sort of empty, you know, vague love, but God loved the world in this particular way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life, the love of God for the world, which Jesus, by the way, is a willing sacrifice in terms of embracing that. It embraces every person on the globe, every, every kind of sinner, every age, every stripe. It's beyond question the love of God in this gospel. Jesus loves the world in an unparalleled, undeniable fashion, laying down his life on the cross. He is given for the world, even a world in opposition. If that is you, you're not disqualified forever, but invited now. I mean, this is the kind of love that Jesus shows. It's not vague, it's not empty, it's, it's a bloody love. You can be on the outside, or excuse me, rather, you can be on the inside of verse 9. That's what the gospel is telling us where Jesus demonstrates his shepherding care for all those who trusted him. These verses, they are a touching and revealing portrait of Jesus. On the night before his body would be ripped to shreds, hours before he would be crowned with thorns, just a, less than a day, before his limbs would be fastened to a Roman cross, Jesus prays for those who belong to him. I don't know what could be a more comforting truth than this. We'll get to the individual petitions in a moment, but it's good to pause and appreciate the fact of the petitions for a moment, just the fact of the petitions. Church, you have a great high priest. You have a great high priest who ever lives to make intercession for you. It's a beautiful picture of this in the Old Testament. Unfortunately, that picture is, or at least unfortunate for us, in the way that we often read the Bible, we often fly over this passage. We miss the picture because it's couched in all the details of Exodus 25 and following. It's a little section where if you get to it in your Bible reading plan, you start moving just a little faster. You know, there's all that gold and silver and materials and construction and instructions, you think, well, what does this have to do with me? But in there, there is a little description, instruction, about the construction of the high priest's garments. It's there on your notes from Exodus chapter 28, verses 9 through 12. Listen to what the high priest who would intercede for the people of God, how he... How he, what he would wear. He says, you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six of their names on the one stone and the names of the remaining six on the other stone. 
in the order of their birth. As a jeweler engraves signets, so you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in settings of gold filigree, and you shall set the two stones on the shoulder piece of the ephod as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. In verse 29, So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breastplate of, on the, in the breastpiece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. In a sense, this passage is part of the ultimate fulfillment of that name-bearing work. To say it differently, you are not a number to Jesus. You're not a nameless face to Jesus. His, your concerns are his concerns. Your trials known by him, your fears and worries, they are not trivial to him. Your struggles and doubts are not ignored by him. He cares for you. Almost half of this prayer is taken up with this truth, just of Jesus' compassion and concern for his people. As Ryle said, you should lean back your soul against this truth. Thomas Hooker, Puritan writer, said, No man's condition so safe as ours. The, pri- the prayer of Christ is more than sufficient, both to strengthen us, be we ever so weak, and to overthrow all adversary power, be it ever so strong and potent. If you're not a follower of Christ, I would return you to the love of Christ for you and the possibility of Christ for you. There isn't a single person here who can say, Well, I know all the people who are verse 9 people. I know who's in and I know who is out. That is well beyond our pay grade. We do not know that. What we do know, the only indicator in the text, is that the people who receive the word belong to Jesus. And so we would encourage you this morning to hear the word. Hear the word preached not only in this sermon. Hear the, pre- the word that we have read. Hear the invitation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever comes to me, Jesus says, I will not turn away. We encourage you this morning to come to Jesus. To acknowledge your sin. Trust him as your savior. Have Jesus as the good shepherd of your soul now and into eternity. That's the prayer. What about the prayer? Verses 11 Second half of that, verse 11, all the way down through verse 26. There are essentially two divisions. And so the passage really breaks out fairly easily. First, verse 11, all the way down to verse 19, Jesus makes prayer, uh, Jesus prays, makes petitions for his disciples in the present. So think those in the room. And then he makes petitions for those to come the disciples in the future, verses 20 through 26. Now, there's overlap, and so you may read this and say, well, how do I know which one is for me? All of it is for us, in a sense. Obviously, all of these apply to those who belong to Jesus. But I think there is an order. There's a, a natural order to Jesus praying for those who are in the room, those who have been his disciples, and then Jesus praying for those that are to come. And the reason that's natural is because these are about to be left behind. And so his heart His heart goes out to them. He's praying for them. Notice what it says in verse 11. We'll read this part again. Verse 11 and following the second half. Holy Father. Which that kind of signals that we're kind of moving into a different section there. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with you, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And the reason I read all of that is just kind of give you that big picture of what Jesus is asking. Notice how the dominant theme in the prayer is this idea of keeping. It's the idea of keeping. So how do you know that? Because look at how it brackets, really, this part of the petition, this part of the prayer in verse 11 and verse 15. 
Both of them are concerned with this idea of keeping. He says, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the last part of verse 11. And then verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. In fact, even the context around that keeping is similar in both cases. The reason that he he prays for them to be kept in verse 11 is his departure at the beginning of verse 11. He acknowledges that. Same idea in verse 15. He is going away, but they are not. So he prays that they would be kept. Jesus' overriding concern is that the Father would preserve and protect his disciples from a hostile world and a hateful devil. That's his overriding concern. Not in the sense, to be clear, not in the sense that nothing would ever happen to them, no harm befall them, no tribulation come their way, no pain in the forecast. God, we know from Scripture, sanctifies our trials. He bends our suffering to his purposes and for our good. Now, the keeping here is, you may want to underline this. Go back to verse 11, the last part of it. The keeping here is in your name which is a shorthand way of saying according to your character. Another way to say that is God, keep them faithful. God, keep them united to my word, to my truth. The keeping here is not the absence of trouble. It rather is the preservation from sin and spiritual shipwreck. In fact, That is why Judas is mentioned at exactly this point, verses 12 and 13 there. He is not kept. Why? Because he did not belong to Jesus in the first place. Jesus never loses a single sheep. Rather, he keeps them all. And one of the means by which he does that is even this prayer. He prays for us. I love how D.A. Carson frames this prayer of Jesus in contrast to our own prayers. So it would be a good exercise, I think, as we apply this passage. Think about your own prayers. Think about what, what, what occupies the menu in, that, in your prayers. What is it that you are petitioning the Father for? D.A. Carson points out the contrast. He said the spiritual dimensions of this prayer of Jesus are consistent and overwhelming. By contrast, we spend much more time today praying about our health, our projects, our decisions, our finances, our family, and even our games than we do praying about the danger of the evil one. It's one of the reasons, we'll talk about this in time to come, but it's one of the reasons that we want to begin, even this fall, giving ourselves more to this kind of prayer. As we gather on Sunday nights together, and we're going to ask the Lord to teach us to pray. And part of that involves what do we even pray for? How can we pray for the things that are most lasting, the things that are most important, things that are absolutely eternal, the things that Jesus would want us praying about, even being kept according to the name? I find it of some comfort that even when my prayers are lacking, Jesus never are. That's what he's saying this morning. And though this world with devil's fields to threaten, to undo us, we will not fear. For God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word by Jesus shall fail him. Jesus prays on our behalf. Notice the byproducts in that. And so you may want to kind of underline even as we go forward. This has, again, a logic to it. He is praying that we be kept according to the name. And then there are things that come from that. There are things that flow from that. Those are the that's that follow in verses 12 and 13. One in each verse. That we may be one in verse 12, even as Jesus and the Father are one. And verse 13, that we may have the joy of Jesus fulfilled in us. Notice the direct connection between faithfulness to God's character, being kept in the name, and unity in the body. Keep them in the name. Go back up to verse 11. Keep them, Holy Father, keep them in your name that they may be one even as we are one. How does that work? How does it work that as we are kept, as we are kept in the name that that then leads to unity in the body, which Nick prayed for? 
A.W. Tozer, I think, provides a great illustration at this point. He said, Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers met together, each looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. Indeed, it's this sort of affection for Christ that then explains the second result. Again, these just kind of follow as a matter of course from one another, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them, verse 13. I think it's remarkable that in a passage filled with hostility, where hostility is in the background so prominently, that joy is then brought to the foreground, even the dead center of the section. The point is that hatred by the world and happiness in Jesus, they're not mutually exclusive. According to Jesus, they go hand in hand. If you're not a Christian, I hope you see that Jesus wants something for you as much as he wants something from you. Jesus is always the giver. That's, that's that rule one of the gospel. Jesus is always the giver. Yes, he wants you to worship him, but not because he needs that. Again, go back up to verse 5. He has had this glory from all, from all of eternity. He wants you to worship him because you need that. Augustine said that our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. And friend, if you're a Christian, it's a good reminder for us as well. Holiness is not about subtraction from your life. Holiness is about addition to your life. Jesus said in John 10, I have come that you may have life and you may have it abundantly. Brothers and sisters, the things that Jesus warned you about are the things that will kill you. He's a good shepherd. He's watching out for your soul. There are things that will deaden your heart there are sins that will destroy your peace of mind. There are patterns of behavior that will steal from your soul, even disturb your sleep. Align yourself with this prayer. Be faithful in little and in much. Why? That his joy may be fulfilled in you. Test the Lord on that. Give yourself to faithfulness. Ask the Lord even to keep you in his name, aligning yourself with this prayer and see the joy of Christ in your life. Jesus begins by praying that they'll be kept, but then notice how he moves from that, verse 17 and following. And he's not leaving it behind how it's connected to what follows, verse 17 through 19. He says, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in the truth. Very simply, Jesus is forming a missionary band through prayer. Jesus is forming those who will, who will preach the gospel. That's the very clear meaning of sanctification here in these verses. It's not just that they will be kept holy, although that is absolutely true. What Jesus is praying here for, in, what Jesus is praying for in particular here, is that the disciples will be set apart, just like the instruments of the temple, that they will be separated and used particularly for the purposes of God. Through the word, through prayer, through the power of the cross, Jesus is consecrating disciples as he departs and they remain. I love how Bruce Milne puts it all together. He says, It is the Father's holiness which is the basis of the Son's mission. That holiness in its separation from sin and its dedication to the way of righteousness, Jesus now desires in the disciples. The mission is one of light confronting darkness. Its instruments, hence, must be sons of light who do not walk in darkness. They are to be set apart for the gospel of God. Isn't it beautiful how this prayer for the disciples ultimately does prove to be for the world also? You see, it is only as the witness is carefully preserved that the gospel can be continually preached. And so even when Jesus is praying for his disciples, that prayer overflows in love for the world. 
That's what happens if you read the rest of it again. Notice how it kind of builds on one, one verse upon a time, one section upon a time. Verse 20 he says, I do not ask for these only. So now Jesus is moving to pray for those who will come, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they, may be in, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you have sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Now, in a sense, the prayer that Jesus prays for future disciples is not totally different than what he prayed for the present disciples. So you still see things about obedience, about unity, about joy. But there is definitely a sense in which the horizons of Jesus have expanded at this point in the prayer beyond the present disciples. He sees a worldwide harvest that will take place because of the preserved keeping witness of Peter, James, and John, other disciples. And it's, it's likely that multiplication and exponential growth of the church, that's, that's why it causes Jesus really to double down on this prayer for unity and harmony in the body. That Jesus sees this expansion of the church. And Jesus is well aware of class warfare, of racial strife, gender war, social conflict, and more. Jesus was well aware that the gospel would go to people on every end of that spectrum. The potential for division was massive. The power of unity, though, more massive. And that's why Jesus prays that we'd be one. And that's why we want to pray particularly, and why we do pray particularly and explicitly for unity. Nick even prayed for that. And we're going to pray for that here in a moment as we have a prayer of intercession for unity at Christ Fellowship Church. That's why we pray the same for Briarwood Presbyterian Church or for Dawson Memorial Baptist. And not just unity in those churches, but unity among these churches. Churches aligned with Jesus are not rivals, but relatives. We are not in competition, Christ Fellowship Church. We are not in competition with other people who preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We rejoice at that preaching. Brothers and sisters who know and worship and love the same king, we rejoice that God has made us family. And again, notice the point of that unity. Verse 21, the second part of it, says, So that the world can see and believe that Jesus is sent from the Father. It has an apologetic purpose to it a defending of the gospel, a picture of the gospel even. Roger Fredrickson, he wrote a commentary on the gospel of John. Before he wrote that commentary, uh, he indicates in that work that he was once a pastor. And as he was pastoring a church at one point, some 20 years prior to him coming to that church, that church had experienced some kind of division. And so we know how that often goes. Tragically, the churches that divide and divide and divide. And so he happened to be, he happened to come to one of those churches that had divided sometime past. But in God's grace, there was the opportunity and the willingness from both of those churches to gather back together to repent of that division and to seek reconciliation with one another. And so they had a special service of reconciliation. And so he said they sang together, they laughed together, they sang, Great is thy faithfulness. And he said that the next day, small town, the next day on the street, people were stopping people from both of those churches, people who did not go to those churches, but stopping people who went to those churches and commenting, quote, We heard the good news. They, of course, meant that unintentionally. But Roger Frankson points out, he says, Good news indeed. It's a picture of the gospel. It's a picture of the union even between the Father and the Son. The gospel is obscured, brothers and sisters, by our hate toward fellow Christians. It's obscured by our indifference toward fellow Christians. But it is made visible by our evident love for one another. That doesn't mean, to be clear, that doesn't mean all we need to do is if we'll just love Jesus, then everybody's going to believe in Jesus. But it does mean that our preaching should not be contradicted by our living. And that is especially true in a local congregation 
where we don't just live with brothers and sisters in theory, but where we covenant with one another to bear one another's burdens, to share each other, to share each other's burdens, bear each other's sorry, bear each other's burdens, share each other's joys. Bruce Millen again pointed application. He said the biggest barriers to effective evangelism according to the prayer of Jesus are not so much outdated methods or inadequate presentations of the gospel as realities like gossip, insensitivity, negative criticism, jealousy, backbiting, an unforgiving spirit, a root of bitterness, failure to appreciate others, self-preoccupation, greed, selfishness, and every form of lovelessness. Again, are our lives aligned with the prayer of Jesus or are we living against the very things that Jesus is praying for? I love the conclusion. We won't spend long, but the conclusion, verse 24, where Jesus prays, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. It's hard to beat that verse, isn't it? Never been to Israel, but I get the appeal to Christians not only to better understand the Bible, but to walk in the very places where Jesus walked. So to imagine Jesus teaching on the shores of Galilee or journeying down the road to Jericho or sitting beside a well in Samaria, we long to see him. Peter captured this in his letter to fellow Christians. He said, though you have not seen him, you love him. Smuggled into that sentence, of course, is the desire of every Christian to see Jesus, just as Peter saw him. Well, Jesus prays for us that one day faith will become sight. And I want to remind you, church, Jesus' prayers are always heard. They are always right. And they are always answered. And I saw no temple in the city, John says. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and its light is the Lamb. By its light the nations will walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and the gates of it will never be shut by day. There will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Let's pray. So until that day, Lord, would you keep us every day? Would you make us one, even as you are one with the Father? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, like every Lord's Day, we gather around the table. We celebrate the blood that is shed for us, the body that is broken for us. I'd encourage you, as you come to the table this morning, if those that have trusted in Christ that you would take this opportunity to see with your own eyes the unity for which Jesus prays here. Everyone who knows Christ by faith, united to one another in the faith. And so I encourage you to celebrate that this morning as we gather around, as we sing together. If you're fearful, you're trembling, also take heart. Jesus prays for you. This prayer is not just some vague prayer. It's grounded in his blood. It is grounded in his righteousness. It is heard. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Jesus will conquer. Jesus will keep you to the end. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus. We're very clear that the coming to the table is not the way to know him. Rather, it is to acknowledge your sin to repent of that, to trust in Jesus, his death on the cross. If you have questions about that, we'd love to answer those for you. We'd love to talk with you, pray with you. I'm sure any Christian here would love to have a conversation with you about how you can have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We just want to be very clear about what this, is, what this meal is intended for, what it means, what it communicates. If you're here this morning, you've identified with Jesus. We would love to celebrate the table with you. There are tables all around the room. I invite you to make your way to those as we celebrate the Lord Christ and what he has done for us.
cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus played and died for me I see his wounds his senses feet my Savior all that cursed tree body bowed and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy storm Messiah still and all of Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I want you to stand as we sing. Then on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the
questions about anything you heard, please feel free to use that blue tear out or use that QR code, whichever is more convenient. Every week as we want, we want to remind ourselves why we give and how we give. We do that from 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. We invite you to say that with me. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. They're offering baskets to the outside. If you take those and pass them to the middle of the room as we receive our offering, uh, 